Hey there, Lions. Did you know that you can get access to exclusive bonus audio content by joining our paid support group, the Lions of Liberty Pride? For as little as $5 a month, you can help us grow this program to new heights. Learn more by heading over to lionsofliberty.com slash support. This is the people standing up saying, no, government, you can't do this. If we do nothing, nothing will change. So let's come together on this. Let's use our organization for the greater good, which is to simply assist them. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Hello, friends of liberty, or maybe future friends of liberty, if you're still working on it. That's okay. That's why we're here. And welcome and happy Monday. It's a big day. It's a big Monday. We're going to start the week off right because today I've got a Liberty double feature for you. That's right. I'm going to highlight two different causes, two different very important Liberty causes, I feel, and ones that hopefully a lot of you are going to find interesting and want to get involved with. So I'm bringing you not one, but two interviews today. Really excited about it. One of these interviews, by the way, uh, one of your, the second interview you're going to get with Shane Robbins, uh, where we talk about the Cuban Libertarian Party. This one was actually released a couple weeks ago to our paid support group, the Lions of Liberty Pride. So thank you so much to all the Pridesters out there who keep this operation going. Of course, in addition to some early releases, you get all sorts of additional podcasts that we like to do. Some hot takes. We do some extra roundtables, some extra time with some guests on the show. Whole lot of fun for as little as five bucks a month. So be sure to check that out. Lionsofliberty.com slash support has all the information you need. And of course, while you're there surfing the web, be sure to check out today's sponsors, martinarmory.com. And Martin Armory is awesome because not only is it owned by a libertarian, so you can support a fellow libertarian, that's always nice, but they also offer the best prices out there because they only focus on the top 25 most popular guns on the market. Plus, you can get free shipping by using the discount code LIONS. So go ahead and check them out over at martinarmory.com. And because we got two guests and we're going to talk about a whole lot of stuff, you're not going to want to miss the show notes, which you can find over at Lions of Liberty. Liberty.com slash 305, this being the 305th episode of this program. Without further ado, let's get to my first guest. Here with me now is a former presidential candidate who vied for the Libertarian Party's nomination in 2016, and he's here to discuss what is truly an amazing ballot measure that he is putting forward in his state of Colorado, looking to limit the government's ability to profit from fines. Really excited to talk about that, and I am pleased to welcome back Steve Kerbell. Steve are you ready to roar? You betcha, Mark. Uh, may not may not roar in uh, in in uh, too much volume, but we're, I'm roaring in spirit. How about that? That's all we ask. You know, everybody's roar comes out a little bit different, but as long as it's there in the soul, you know, that's all that really matters. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, Steve, it's a pleasure talking to you again. And as we we're talking about before the show, you've been on here before. Uh, it was almost two years ago. I can't even believe that because you were actually running for the Libertarian Party nomination at the time. You were one of the, the first people to announce uh, their intention to run for that. And pretty early on, you did decide to drop out and support Gary Johnson. So what was behind your decision to pull back on your own campaign and to get the, behind the Johnson campaign? Well, I have lots of reasons. I mean, uh, it, it was, I was running pretty hot for quite a while, and I ran for a year. I traveled around the country. I went coast to coast. I met a lot of people. I learned a lot, and I built an, an organization that was pretty good. But also, you know, the fact is when it came down to it, you know, I was doing pretty well. Then Gary got in, and his infrastructure was quite strong. And, you know, I always play to win. If I'm going to get into something, my intention is to win it. And in this case, the best thing I could do as as the handwriting was already on the wall – was really to be able to to join up because my whole purpose of getting involved was to try and spread liberty, to try and bring options to the people, try and, and really crack down on the abuse of authority that I had seen government do over and over again. So it, it seemed like it was in 2016, based on what was already going on, I could do the most good by joining up with Gary and, and trying to help him you know, spread his word. And, and as it turned out, it was a great experience and something I'll never forget. Yeah, and many people run for president uh, who don't think they're going to win the nomination for a number of reasons. It might be to just raise their profile, to you know, to bring attention to some other cause. Uh, but for you, you really were in it to win it. So once you saw that that wasn't you know, where things were going to go, you pretty much figured, well, I might as well get with the guy who I, I do think is going to win, who I do think has a chance to maybe spread this message a little bit more. Yeah, it, that was the thing. To, like I say, I don't, I don't get into something 
anything unless I intend to be successful with it. And so after that, of course, I helped Gary. I did some campaigning for him, and, and I did some consulting with him after the nomination. I also went and took over my local county affiliate uh, to try and bring them through a hard time, and that was uh, successful, and that was good. And uh, there was just a lot going on in my life, so it happened to be uh, just the, the right thing to do at the time. And um, as I say, it, you know, you got to be in it to win it, or why bother? Because I don't really care about profile. I I was told, you know, all through my business career, and I was a CEO for 20 years of fairly large corporations that did business in many states. And everyone I know that always said, that was very very successful, and very wealthy, always used to tell me, "You got to be crazy to get into politics." Well, <laughs> I guess I was a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to argue with that point. <laughs> Steve, as you know, I mean, a lot of people have been critical of the Johnson Weld campaign. I have no desire to do an entire another show about that. But I am curious uh, about your reflections on the campaign, uh, just from your perspective as someone who worked within the campaign, who was able to see a lot of a lot of the goings on and to see the end results. So, I mean, is there anything you would maybe have done different if, if Steve Carbell was running for president? Or uh, what, what do you kind of think about the overall results of the Johnson Weld campaign? Well, that's a good question. It's kind of hard to keep your ego in check, but the reality is, had I been the nominee, I would have done things very differently. And it's hard to say if it would have been more successful, less successful. But what I, the thing that uh, I had a couple of challenges. I mean, my job was basically to be the liaison between the campaign and the highest levels of the Libertarian Party. And so, uh, you know, I, I ran the uh, um, advisory board uh, with with a lot of high profile Libertarians and. You know, and and the the biggest thing for me is every time Gary or most often Bill would say something, I'd have to answer for it with that group. So, <laughs> that that, that you know, sounds like a, not the most desirable job. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wanted. To, I had to make sure that I was having a little bit of a, of tequila before those meetings. But <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the, the fact is really, you know, I have a lot of respect for those guys. And did they do everything I wish they would have done? No. Did they do things I wish they hadn't? Yeah. But the fact is, you know, Gary. He traveled across the country. He gave just booming speeches, just nailed it. And the problem was that, of course, the media was a challenge because they wouldn't cover the myriad amazing things that he did on the road. They'd only cover if, if he messed something up, and that got frustrating. He didn't make a lot of mistakes, but that's all that ever got publicized. And, and the reality is, yeah, I mean, did I disagree uh, oftentimes with Bill? Yeah, I did. But you know, the fact is he's a good man, and he, um, he one of the things that impressed me about him was his ability to convey the um, – historical references in the in the uh, years of the revolution with such a way that it was just it could really paint a beautiful picture so you know a talented guy uh and and uh you know um I, I don't really like to say any bad things i don't have much bad to say i mean yes we disagreed from time to time but these were good guys you know and and uh i learned a lot in this experience and it was fun to work with them and you know, as I say, uh, if this ever comes up again, then I probably would do things differently based on that experience. Well, time will tell on that. But uh, like you mentioned, Steve, you're in things to win them. And uh, I know that you're in it to win it with this ballot measure you're proposing in Colorado. And I really think it can serve as a model for states, for countries all over the world. So I think it's a really amazing piece of, of proposed legislation. And when it comes to libertarian legislation, and, and some anarchists and other libertarians out there will cringe at me even saying that <laughs> phrase, libertarian legislation. But I do believe there is a way to craft such things. And to me, uh, some piece of libertarian legislation should have a couple qualities. One is that it actually is libertarian, meaning it either increases individual liberty in some, some way or decreases the power of the state. But the other side of that is that in our current environment, it has to be something that uh, many non-libertarians, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, can get behind. And as far as I can tell, the measure you're proposing in Colorado really does check all of those boxes. So why don't you just get into it right now? Tell us about this ballot me measure that you're proposing. Well, thanks, Mike. This is exciting for me because you're right. I mean, this is appealing to the majority of people. It doesn't matter their political affiliation because, you know, I'll back up and explain this. This is a movement I started called Stop the Shakedowns. And in my view, of course, a shakedown is when somebody comes up and tries to take money out of your pocket or some, some other way they can, they can steal from you. And government has become just experts at this in so many different ways. I mean we pay more than taxes. They've got every – every time you breathe, sneeze, or cough, they've found other ways to get your money. So you know, it, one thing that has affected the majority of the voting population is this desire for cash – in a in a forceful manner at the hands of some sort of representative of government. Now, typically, basically, what this law is going to do is, if it passes, and I believe this will pass, um, 
basically what it does is it says no government agency or entity in the state of Colorado can receive one red cent from fines, forfeitures, or penalties. And so this means you know, any cities that survive off of, uh, off of speed traps, regulators that attack businesses with impunity because they get to keep the money, heck, they ought to have masks and guns. You know, and so what happens is in all these different things that the state reaches out to do or in the cities and anybody else, it's all about just finding a creative way to get your money via force. So what this law says is they just can't have the money. And so I believe what will happen when this thing passes is, well, first of all, they're all going to it's going to scramble and go, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? But <laughs> but they have to get jobs. Well, well yeah, they're, they're going to have to actually do things the way we intend them to do it. I mean, laws were put in purpose. For a reason, a lot of them are horrible, some of them are necessary, but the fact is when they take advantage of those laws to take money from the people that they wouldn't even bother to enforce if there wasn't a financial gain, then if they take away the money, then will we get this judicious enforcement where you know, if you're going to go 90 in a 30 zone, yeah, you should probably get a ticket. You know, uh, but if you're going 57 and a 55 and they pull you over, this is not a thing to do with safety. This is about making money. So this is, happens, you know, all levels of enforcement all throughout the state. There are there is a financial motivation to enforcing and creating certain laws and regulations. If you're driving uh, and you see a radar gun, you're going to have one of three thoughts. Thought number one: Oh, thank God they're protecting me. Well, you're probably not going to have that thought, are you? Mark? I don't know many people that have ever that have that thought, but it's it's a possible one. It's I'll give possible. you that. Possible. <laughs> I've never seen it in my life, but it could be somebody drives by and go, "Oh, thank God!" But there's got to be someone out there. It, it, yeah, it takes all kinds, right? <laughs> so now the second one is, oh, crap, I hope I'm not speeding. I can't afford another ticket. And the one that's probably the most common, and I'll use the analogy of the state of Colorado, looks like Denver needs money. And, <laughs> and that's what people think. And the beautiful thing is I've done my own surveying, and you know, a lot of our libertarian causes, while they're you – know, in my view, they're all right. You know, and things that we're trying to accomplish. You know, the statements we make, we we're on the we're just right on the button on so many things. But a lot of people, what I've learned too, like for example, I've been a, a big opponent of the drug war, and you know that's a harder sale because you know people don't tend to care about what happens to other people as long as it's not them or their family. So if somebody gets arrested or their life gets ruined because they've held some sort of a substance that the government doesn't sanction, they don't care. Uh, but the thing about this is. They do care because hmm. the majority of people have received a ticket that they felt was financially motivated, and that means a majority of voters, when they see this opportunity to bring in judicious enforcement, uh, they're going to they're going to support it. And another thing that's important too that I want to add is, you know, some people, you know, the, a lot of the uh, law and order folks out there, they go, "Oh, you're just bashing cops." Well, here's the truth: we're helping them <laughs> because most police officers that I know took the job because they wanted to serve their communities. It's their employers that turned them into armed collectors. And it's not like the cop themselves is profiting from no, giving you that not. fine. <laughs> they're not. And, and, and they're, they're being forced to do a job they don't want to do uh, because you know once you take a job, you're pretty much used to the fact that you better maintain it or you're going to find yourself in a financial issue. But the fact is most of the police officers did not take the job to become armed collectors for the state. They took the job to serve their communities, and this will allow them to do that because it removes the financial motivation of their employers. Now, so that's one interesting part about this bill and or ballot measure, I guess you would call it. Yeah. And I know that some libertarians or, or, and or anarchists are, are not going to like about this measure. And that's that it does not remove the ability to find, but rather it redirects where those funds would go. So why did you choose this approach instead of just saying, oh, you can't you can't have speeding tickets anymore. You can't issue fines anymore. Why did you use this other approach that simply redirects who gets that money? Because uh, I want it to pass for one thing. <laughs> you know, the, right. the, the thing is, like I say, I'm in things to 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 win and to to make impact. And so, you know, I could have taken the tact where let's make a bill. First of all, each in Colorado, every ballot initiative is allowed only one subject. So if I wanted to go after every law, you know, it's not going to happen. It's going to be impossible. So basically, what this does, and this actually has a couple of prongs to this. First, it gets rid of enforcement for profit, which I think brings a more peaceful state all by itself. And it, while it doesn't remove the laws completely or it doesn't remove the fines, uh, it does uh, it, it does bring it to more judicious enforcement. And I need to add something else too. I didn't say where the money went after they were fined. Well, if there's a victim, the victim is paid first. But 99 out of 100 times, there is no victim. It's just a way of the state taking your money. So in that case, 
The person who is fined can choose a charity of their choice anywhere in the state of Colorado as long as they don't have a personal or indirect financial interest in that charity. So what will happen is this becomes tax deductible. It's another win-win. But the, the key is you can't let the money get into the hands of government. Because once you do that, they're going to use it to get more out of you. I like that it's tax deductible. So you could actually save money on your taxes by getting pulled over a few there times. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really, you know, the, the, this, thing, this made a lot of sense. And when people started to consider it, I mean, yeah, it never, no one's ever going to be happy. There's going to be some people that say you shouldn't vote or whatever. But, but the fact is, you know, and this, this is actually a good argument against their non-voting thing too because people are so – dead set against most legislation because what does it do? It, it takes away your rights and freedoms. It, it, it's another way for you to get locked up. It's another thing to cost you money, another thing government can use against you. But this is kind of something new that we don't see too often and we haven't since the Bill of Rights was crafted. This is the people standing up saying, no, government, you can't do this instead of government doing the opposite, which is what we're used to. So if people can realize that there are initiatives like this, you get out and vote, it's not going to be coercion. It's not going to be damaging. It's not anything other than the people standing up saying, now nah, you can't do this anymore, government. We don't trust you, and, and it's time to call you, put you back in the cage. And, and that's kind of what we're doing. So I'm hoping that this will continue to spread. I've actually received interest from lots of places. I understand that the city of uh, Bellingham, Washington, is looking to uh, uh, to create this initiative for their city and run it. Uh, I, I've heard that there is a uh, uh, a serious candidate in New Hampshire that wants to make this part of the platform. Uh, Alaska is considering uh, running this. He's even reached out by Queensland, Australia. Wow. Uh, re- I mean, people love this because this is a uniform thing. Everyone has been abused by government seeking cash. Right. What's great about it is that nobody can make the argument that. We need these fines for safety. We, we need to, to have these certain measures and, and find people to deter them from dangerous activity because you're not removing the fine. You're, you're merely removing the, the profit motive from the government agencies that are enforcing the fines. So they can still go out and enforce the fines once this measure passes, but it's only going to go to, like you said, charities or to re- recompensating a victim. And, and likely they're going to be a lot less motivated to go around and, and give maybe the $57 speeding or the 57 mile per hour ticket for the 55 mile per hour zone when it's really not, you know, it's not helping them in any way. Well, exactly. And, you know, it's funny. There's there's a actually it's probably not funny, but there, there's a, a few towns in Colorado that are infamous for this. One of them is called Mountain View. It's a six block by two block town. Uh, on the west side of the Denver metropolitan That's area. That's a small town. <laughs> well, but the, you know what? They make 53% of their town's revenue from giving tickets. Wow. Uh, there are There's one town called Compo, Colorado. Apparently 93% of their revenue comes from tickets. And, and 93. people ask, 93. And people ask, well, what are these cities supposed to do? Well, you know, <laughs> I, here's my answer. Don't be a city. If the only way you can fund your city is by highway robbery, then you shouldn't have been a city to begin with. There are other things that they could do. They can be become part of another city that actually you know, funds itself more prop, uh, properly. But highway robbery is just not acceptable, and it does break down the fiber of any kind of credibility that any government entity may have with the public if all they're doing is trying to rip off their money. So I think basically you hear these people saying, oh, speeding is dangerous, blah, 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 blah. Well, the fact is we're going to make them put their money where their mouth is. If you really believe it's dangerous, come on, baby. You just can't have the money. You know, yeah. And we'll see what happens. And, and, uh, and I, I suspect that what we'll see is when enforcement happens, somebody actually did something wrong. What's the process here for actually getting this on the ballot in Colorado? I, I, I imagine it's, it's not something you can just do with the, the flip of a switch. You probably need to go out and get signatures and that kind of thing. So what's the progress on that front? It's a big job. I submitted this to the Secretary of State already. We have a hearing at the Capitol uh, on the 19th. And at that hearing, it's about the language of the, of the initiative uh, where the Secretary of State will, will basically uh, tell us, well, okay – what do you intend to accomplish? Does this accomplish that? Do we need to make any changes? So once we get all the, the language honed in, then it'll be time for, for petitioning. We're going to need a little over 98,500 certified petition signatures to get this on the ballot. Now, that's, that's a pretty tall order. It doesn't sound like a big number to people in larger states, but the fact is you have to assume they're going to throw out as many as they can because they're going to hate this. So what we're going to have to do is get about 150,000 signatures, I think, and we'll have six months to do that. We are, I'm hoping that we can start the petitioning around the 1st of August. We'll go through all the machinations we need to to get this done. And so at that point, once it's on the ballot, that's when I think the fun will begin because you can imagine the kind of pushback we're going to get 
you know, and, and it's going to be very, very vocal. And I expect it to be on national mainstream media because the people don't stand up against the government too often, especially in something like this. We're really calling their bluff. And, and this is going to gain a lot of notice. So the, the, the more they fight, the better it's going to be because the more national media will get and the more this will spread. Uh, and, and so uh, it, it's a very difficult process. You know, there are certainly some pitfalls and landmines along the way. Uh, we're doing our best to do everything properly. Uh, and uh, I think we've worded the, the legislation in such a way or the initiative in such a way that it does accomplish what we want. But one of the nice things is I did put in a bit of a, a statement from the people of the state of Colorado as the first section where basically we're saying, you know what, <laughs> we're, we, we want judicious enforcement. We think it's a conflict of interest that you get to keep the money. So we're just not going to let you do that anymore. So we're really sending a very strong message. We've already gotten a fair amount of media, uh, and, uh, and that's just going to continue. But I just love the fact that this is spreading across the country like wildfire. All right, Steve. Well, like I said, I, I have a hard time arguing or, or even imagining an argument, libertarian or otherwise, against this legislation, unless you're maybe the head of a police department or, or something like that. <laughs> right. So I, I really think this has, has a great chance of getting some traction. Where can people go to find some more info about this ballot measure and how they can help support you and support your efforts here? We have a website. It's called uh, www.stoptheshakedowns.com. Dot com. And in there, it allows you to sign up to be a volunteer. Volunteers are a very, very important part of this process to get it on the ballot and to spread the word and to make this thing successful. There will also be the ability to make donations. As, as you know, this is the part of politics that we all hate, but you got to ask for money if you expect to get anything done. So certainly financial support is, is absolutely necessary to make this endeavor successful. You will also be able to make a donation there or to the uh, to the physical address. That's stoptheshakedowns.com, and, and that's something I think we all would like to do in our life is, is stop all these damn shakedowns. Steve, one more question yes. before I let you go here, just to circle back, because uh, I don't want to let you off the hook entirely. Uh, <laughs> do you have any do you have any thoughts or plans about running for president once again in 2020? Well, you know, we are pretty far away from that, and I'm very focused on making this happen. But uh, in all honesty, yeah, if, if, uh, <laughs> if the opportunity makes itself possible, I do hope to run. But as I said, I only run if I intend to win. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. What, what does the world look like at that time? What's the landscape? You know, what's going on in my life? Do I have the ability to really give it my all? We'll find out, but uh, I sure hope to, but I guess we'll see in a couple of years. Well, I'll tell you what, Steve, if you get this passed in Colorado, I mean, you're going to have a, a hell of a nice little tidbit for your, your presidential candidate resume in 2020 if you do decide to run. So uh, I, I definitely support you on this measure, and, uh, and I hope people will reach out, especially people in Colorado. But like we said, you don't have to be in Colorado to support this measure because this is the kind of thing where if it passes in Colorado and takes off, just like Colorado was the first to pass marijuana, you know, recreational marijuana, uh, this could maybe set off a, a chain reaction throughout many states and, and cause real real true change in this country so steve i wish you the best of luck with this and any of your other adventures thank you so much mark and it's great to be back with you again take care steve it's been a blast thank you Bye -bye. all right folks i hope you enjoyed my little chat there with steve kerbell a guy who's been on the show before be sure to go ahead and check out my interview with steve kerbell way back from 2015 i will of course post that over at today's show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash 305. Now, guys, there's something I got to tell you about. Something I got to tell you about that's very, very important. And that is a contest that we're having. That's right. You guys may have heard about a brand new comic book from our friends at the Johnny Rocket Launchpad, most notably Johnny Adams, who wrote and drew this book. It's called Liberty Force. It's a new comic book designed to help promote the ideas of liberty. And I got to say, Johnny did a spectacular job. I didn't even know that he was an artist until he first started telling me about this project. And they really banged out an amazing uh, piece of work here with Liberty Force. I think it's really going to be something that can help people get interested in the ideas of liberty, which is, of course, really what this is all about. We're not the end of the conversation. We are the start of it. But Johnny was nice enough to offer up five signed copies. That's right. Five signed copies of Liberty Force number one, and we're going to be giving them away. We're going to do this on my birthday, which is August 7th. So Monday. So of course, 
you'll be hearing from me that day. And there's a couple ways to enter that I'm going to tell you about real quick. This will be a raffle, so if you enter, it means you get one entry. You can actually get potentially up to two entries, and there's a couple ways to do it. One is to become a member of the Lions of Liberty Pride uh, for $5 a month. You can find out all the info you need for this over at lionsofliberty.com slash support. We talk about it enough all the time. It's our support group, our saintly group of patrons who help pay our bills and help us to grow this show, help us to market this show, help us to really get it out there. So if you're a member of the Lions of Liberty Pride right now, do nothing more. You're already entered in the raffle, or you can go ahead and go to lionsofliberty.com slash support. Sign on up. Of course, also get discounts on t-shirts at our Lions of Liberty store, all sorts of great stuff. But if you join the Pride, that's one entry. And then if you leave us a review on iTunes, preferably, that's what helps us the most. You can also leave a Stitcher review if you've already left an iTunes review. But either way, just take a screenshot of that review and either post it and tag me so I have to make sure I see it in our private Facebook group, the Lions of Liberty Forum. If you're not a member of that, what are you waiting for? Head on over to Facebook, just type Lions of Liberty Forum. It should pop right up. As long as you're not too much of a weirdo, we should let you right on in. And uh, Or you can email it to me, mark, M-A-R-C, at lionsofliberty.com. Just send me a screenshot of that review. And yes, the answer is yes, you can enter twice. If you send me a screenshot of a review you've done on the show, you will be entered in the contest. And if you're a member of the Pride, you will also be entered in the contest. So you can actually be entered two times. That is possible. That's right. But you can still only win once because we do want to give all five out to different people. Of course, just like everything else I mentioned here on the show today, you can find more information over today's show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash 305. Like I said, we've got more up. We've got Shane Robbins is going to be coming on to give us an update on what's been going on with the Cuban Libertarian Party. It's really interesting stuff. But first, I got to give a quick word to today's sponsors because I firmly believe one of the most important things you can do to protect yourself and your loved ones is to own a firearm. But for a lot of people, buying a gun can be an overwhelming process. There are just so many options and not everyone feels comfortable walking into a gun store. Well, our friends at martinarmory.com are doing their part to change that. Martin Armory was founded with a simple goal to make buying a gun simple and affordable. Instead of carrying thousands of different guns, martinarmory.com only carries 25. This allows them to focus on providing the most popular guns on the market at insanely cheap prices. And now for a limited time, their prices are even more insane as martinarmory.com is offering Lions of Liberty listeners free shipping. Simply go to martinarmory.com, pick an awesome gun, and enter the promo code LIONS. Again, that's martinarmory.com. The promo code is LIONS. Hey guys, this is Roger Paxton, and if you're fed up with the government running every single aspect of your life, but you're not listening to the Lava Flow podcast yet, then what's wrong with you? Check us out at thelavaflow.com, or just go back to sucking up to the government. The Lava Flow podcast, striking the root every single episode. This is Chris Spangle, and I am the host of We Are Libertarians, which you can find in iTunes, Google Play, or at wearelibertarians.com. We are a podcast that brings you all of the irreverence that modern politics deserves by examining current events from a libertarian perspective. So please, check us out at wearelibertarians.com. Hey everyone, the Johnny Rocket Launchpad is Liberty. Each week we strive to bring you the best guests in talk radio. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad delivers weekly interviews of noteworthy politicians, experts, and activists. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad is bringing the party to the Libertarian Party and launching ideas in your direction. Check us out at johnnyrocketlaunchpad.com and you can hear me, Kurt Nelson, and the beautiful Heather Nixon talk about the ideas of liberty, rock and roll. All right, and up next with me now is the regional coordinator for the Libertarian Party of Tennessee. He has been very involved with the goings-on of the Libertarian Party in Cuba. He is Mr. Shane Robbins. Shane, are you ready to roar? Oh, yeah. Now, that was a roar. You know what? You're in some pretty good company. That deep roar was the only person that, that gave me a roar like that, John McAfee. So you're in pretty good company. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know that I'm quite as crazy as the McAfee, but I'll do my best. Now, Shane, how did you go from, you know, you're just a guy working here in the Libertarian Party in Tennessee, working on building up your local chapter. How did you become so interested in what's going on with the Libertarian Party over in Cuba? Back in March, I first read some reports about the abuses and the persecutions um, at the hands of the Castro regime. 
of uh, the Cuban Libertarian Party. I wasn't intensely interested in it until I had heard more reports and there were more arrests, more incarcerations, and more stories of abuse and torture. I became super interested in it in May, and then early June, uh, I drafted our first resolution, and it went through the executive board of the LPTN and passed unanimously, and we submitted it. And from there, I started uh, reaching out more so to the leadership in South America and the leadership in North America of the Cuban Libertarian Party because the CLP doesn't have very good communication access. They only get online once a week for about an hour, and they have South American spokesperson and they have a North American spokesperson. And so um, the, uh, the American information that I read was the first piece, if I remember correctly, was from Nicholas Amato. I think he writes for the Libertarian Republic. He's a American libertarian journalist. That piece only had uh, so much information in it. It left me begging for a lot of answers. And so after I had wrote up the first resolution and reached out to Mamelo Fialo Flor in South America. She's a writer. She's also a translator for the Pan Am Post. It's been wonderful getting a lot of information out of Mamelo because she speaks Spanish. And so she's been able to translate a lot for me. She's been able to speak with the leadership in Cuba and Havana. And then she's been able to turn around right after the conversation and get to me some of the most up-to-date information. Now, when I first started hearing about what's going on with the Libertarian Party, and you'll delve into some more of the details of, of the trouble they ran into in Cuba in a minute, but uh, the first thing that struck me was, oh my God, there's a Libertarian Party in Cuba. I mean, that was even more political freedom than I was even aware that they had, because you know, as you know, uh, political expression in Cuba isn't necessarily uh, protected by the law, not in, in any way, shape, or form. They're quite the opposite. Uh, it's generally frowned upon to speak out against the Castro regime in any way, shape, or form. So what can you tell us about the history of the Libertarian Party in Cuba? How did it develop, and, and how how did the government allow it to even exist? I mean, that, that to me, that, like I said, that was the most surprising thing to find that they even allowed this, uh, what would be considered a really a dissident group. Yeah, it is surprising to a degree. We are talking about a regime that attempts to use a pretty heavy hand upon a lot of people. So they obviously aren't totally successful in every suppression that they would like. I'm sure that the regime is not nearly as dictatorial as they would prefer. <laughs> so there are loopholes. And the Libertarian Party didn't actually get kicked off until this year. But the founder of the Libertarian Party three years ago, his name is Nelson Luis Rodriguez Chartrand, he started a anarcho-capitalist club. And he started this with um, Joyce Garcia. And together, they had come across some information. Um, and this information, it, specifically, it was a lecture from a Spanish professor. And this information, it made them hungry for even more liberty philosophy. And so after they founded this anarcho-capitalist club, it wasn't two years later, they realized the importance of educating the public around them. And so they started a libertarian library, which they named the Ben Franklin Libertarian Library. And after kicking off the Ben Franklin Libertarian Library, they got a lot of attention and they started to be abused by the regime. There were a couple of arrests Early in 2017, in February of 2017, Ubaldo Hernandez and Manuel Vicia, they're imprisoned, they're beaten, and the rest of the Cuban LP were – they felt compelled to post pictures of themselves and make those pictures public so that the regime would have a harder time of making them disappear. That's the degree of fear that these people live under. So I think it's important for folks listening to understand that this is, this is truly – uh, an underhanded, brutal dictatorship that will exercise all authority in order to maintain its power. Yeah, and just to give people more of an idea, if they don't really understand the level of political oppression that goes on in Cuba, I mean, I, I've sp spoken to Cubans before, and I know that often they, they aren't even afraid to speak out against the government or, or be critical of the government, even in their own houses, even in their own neighborhoods, because even within those neighborhoods, even people they consider family and friends, there are people that work with the regime within those communities, and people don't even know if their friends might be someone who could go back and report on something they've been saying. So it really is a, a very repressive mentality, not one where political expression like we're seeing from the people, the very brave people that are active in the Libertarian Party there have 
been expressing. Correct. It's challenging for us as Americans to put ourselves in that headspace because not because we're so free that we couldn't possibly enjoy greater freedom. That's not at all what I'm saying. But I am saying that the freedoms that we experience are far greater than those experienced in Cuba. And so it, it is probably challenging for the average American to contemplate that, for instance, if your father were to commit a crime, say, like what happened recently in the Camagüey province, um, there was a, a father of a family who, who was growing 52 marijuana plants on his stoop. And there's a, a pretty sincere drug war that's waged in Cuba as well, much like in the United States. They have an, a, an incarceration rate that is almost as high as that of the United States. And as most people listening know, the United States incarceration rate is tremendous. We have a couple of million prisoners. And um, Cuba has the same phenomenon. They arrested at a tremendous rate. Well, this man growing marijuana plants, he's arrested. Now, they have something called, which listeners who are familiar with uh, heavy-handed regimes will understand that th there is a collective justice in a lot of nations, wherein if your family member commits a crime, you could find yourself at, at the other end of the justice system as well. So, for instance, this man's family, they were threatened with eviction as a result of uh, this man's decision to raise that crop. And when, when they were threatened with eviction, they, they in turn threatened the regime and said, if you evict us, we will burn this house to the ground. <laughs> Man, there, there are some, some ballsy Cubans out there, huh? Yeah, because there is an end of fear. I mean, there's, there is an end to it. There is a point that people reach, a threshold that people pass. And once they've passed it, they can look in the eyes of a fingerman or, or a special police, a secret police, and they can say exactly what they feel because they're – they're desperate. They have little to lose. And when you're talking about a mother with her children whose husband is already imprisoned for growing marijuana plants, yeah, I can totally understand why she would have said that. And as of now, the information that I have, as of now, she's still in the home and the regime has taken a step back from attempting to confiscate her property. Well, it's not her property. No, there is, yeah, no, there exactly. is no private property to speak of, but it's property that she occupies – Right. And that's another thing to understand about Cuba. People have jobs, people have homes, uh, but none of them are theirs. None of the job isn't really theirs. It's just, it's all assigned by the government. All businesses are run through the government. All housing is run through the government. Education, uh, it, it is really truly as close to a fully centrally planned society as there as there could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a couple of good examples of just how heavy handed. This regime is one is um, back in the latter part of May of this year. Nelson Luis Rodriguez Chartrand, who was the founder, he was walking at night. He was walking home, and he had a backpack on, and in his backpack was a copy of Maria Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty. He was beaten by four men. Uh, they beat him unconscious. They took his shoes. They took his wallet. They drove him 30 kilometers away from his home. They dropped him off barefoot. When he woke up, because he was beaten unconscious, when he woke up, he had to travel back 30 kilometers, uh, broke and barefoot, to get back home. And, and, of course, he can't prove that it was secret police who did that. But that is the sort of thing that does occur you know, within these nations that practice this degree of authoritarian control. So can you, can you t detail a little bit more ex exactly what happened to Nelson after that? I mean, I know he did eventually end up in a Cuban prison. Yes, he's been in prison – uh, a few times. The most recent turn was this this past week. Uh, he spent a few days in prison. I heard uh, yesterday that he was released, so I'm relieved to find that out. That is fantastic news. Yes, it is. Do you have any insight into, I mean, I, I don't know if you've gotten any information from some of your contacts, but do you have any insight into why he was released? Or, I mean, was he even held on specific charges or were they just kind of holding him and just kind of having him sit there waiting for charges? What was the actual situation there? They don't have to declare a crime. It's important too that listeners understand that the period of detention between arrest and trial is indefinite. So we are talking about a regime and a system of law that, that does not afford due process or habeas corpus or uh, legal counsel. You know, we're, we're talking about a system that, that functions simply by the heavy hand of um, bureaucrats and their dictatorial leaders. 
And so, no, we don't know, and we probably won't. But but we do know that he's espousing a philosophy that is antithetical to the philosophy that the regime espouses. One of the main differences between the Libertarian Party and other small parties that have cropped up in Cuba is that the Libertarian ethic is 180 degrees diametrically opposed to this monolithic, authoritarian, um, tyrannical Marxist government. And so I think that this government understands that should the ideas of freedom take root, even in a as small a percentage of the populace as 5%, it could be intergenerationally very dangerous for them. And I think that goes a long way toward explaining why they've decided not to allow people to have internet service in their homes. Um, I think that it explains why a lot of books are illegal. I think it also explains why of the things that they stole from Nelson when he was beaten was a copy of Murray Rothbard's book. Another interesting arrest happened uh, June the 22nd. He and I'll give you the names, and I don't say these names to, to be confusing. I say them because I feel like these people deserve to be recognized. Absolutely. Because they've risked everything in a way that we would find it hard to imagine. And as hard as we do our best to sympathize with what they're living through, because we haven't experienced that degree of tyranny, we really just don't know. But I do know that they deserve for me to mention their names. And I've, I've mentioned Nelson multiple times. The president of the Havana CLP. And the Havana CLP is called Partido Libertario Cubano, uh, Jose Marti. And Jose Marti is a revolutionary fr from the period in which Cuba separated from the Spanish crown. Uh, Caridad Ramirez Utria, the president, she is a member of a group called the Ladies in White. And the Ladies in White are a very brave group. They march every Sunday in Havana, and they do so in opposition to the practice of political imprisonment. And they do so with great violence struck against them routinely. For instance, Caridad, when she was marching last year with the ladies in white, she was beaten so brutally that she had to spend 10 days in intensive care. Wow. And that doesn't stop her. She keeps going. She's one of the ones who, um, when her libertarian brothers were arrested last February, for three months they, they were in prison. And she was one of the ones in, in the night who would run around Havana and plaster pictures of these men and let the public know that these men are guilty of nothing more than espousing a philosophy of freedom. And so we're talking about the tip of the spear in terms of, um, in, terms of uh, in the face violating the executive authority of a regime that has so little respect for an individual's right to live as he or she pleases. And I'm, I'm personally encouraged and I'm inspired by people like Caridad Ramirez Utria. Heriberto Pons is the vice president in Havana, and he is her husband. And so that's that's the core leadership in Havana. They traveled to Camagüey province, which is the eastern portion of the country, in late June. And when they were there, what they were doing was kickstarting a libertarian library and a libertarian party. And they they actually intervened and took pictures while that eviction was taking place that I talked about earlier. And they assumed that the reason that they were – it's hard to say. I mean they could have been arrested because they were taking pictures, because they were being supportive of those being evicted against the state. It could be simply because they were there attempting to recruit to, uh, to ramp up a libertarian effort in the eastern part of the country. Either one of those could have easily gotten them arrested, and they were deported from the east to the west for that. And while they were deported, um, we didn't know what happened to them. So they were taken into state custody. We had no idea where any of them were for several days. And when we, when we did finally find out, we were extremely relieved. It's really incredible, Shane, because, I mean, it, it can be difficult to talk about libertarian ideas here in America, where we have freedom, where we are allowed to talk about the ideas. You can get backlash from just, you know— Stating a libertarian position, especially and I live out here in California. Not many people really hold these beliefs here, uh, but it's a whole different animal when people are are doing these acts, like forming a libertarian party, creating a libertarian library in a repressive regime like Cuba. It is it is truly a revolutionary act. I, there's no really really no other way to say it. And these people absolutely deserve our support. So can you maybe just detail some ways that people, libertarians, freedom lovers, anybody listening right now here in the United States can help our, our libertarian counterparts, our libertarian brethren over in Cuba? 
I would love for us to form a coalition of state parties, county parties. I would love for us to maintain constant contact, to have numerous contact people within the United States who are at least weekly, monthly, communicating with Nelson and Caridad and Heriberto. Another person is Elsa Fernandez Grayel. She's the vice president in the Camagüey province. She spent eight years in a political prison. Well, in a prison, wow. and she was a political prisoner. Yeah, she's a special needs teacher. She's no longer, because of her politics, she's no longer allowed to teach special needs children. And so they will actually yank your livelihood away from you. That's the power of the state. So when folks are advocating for a socialist economy, when they're advocating for the state to be in control of greater and always greater portions of the economy, it would be important to remind them that we, we have a great example, 90 nautical miles off the coast of Florida, in which an economy has been centralized. And through that centralization, you have a planning that ultimately winds up being abusive to a bulk of the people. And it, it winds up creating luxurious circumstances for a very small political minority. And so, yeah, I'm, I continue to be um, very heartened by their dedication. They don't stop. They're, they're persistent. They're not going to stop. And the more that is taken from them, the less they have to lose and the more dangerous they become. So they are in a very dangerous situation. If libertarians in America could unite and we could create a, a, a union among our, our diaspora, if you will, it, it could be for this, for sure. We might be electorally unviable. We both know in, in libertarian circles, because of duopoly, because of the heavy hand of our two-party tyranny and the electoral abuses therein, there are some things that we cannot do as libertarians. There are our, – our populace – is simply not accepting enough right now of our philosophy in general. Now, of course, that's changing and growing, which was evidenced by the last presidential cycle. But um, our duopoly maintains a stranglehold upon electoral politics, and all signs point toward that continuing. So what can we do as an organization? What can we do besides you know, gripe, complain, and, and start little small brush fires on Facebook? I think we can unite around this cause. I think these are people who they chose the Libertarian Party. He, you know, Nelson chose to become affiliated with the Libertarian Party, and he chose it because of the philosophy. He didn't choose it because he expected people like us to help him, but I can guarantee you that he hoped that we would. And that hope, I think, needs to be met with our action. I don't think there's any excuse for it. I think we can do a lot more than we're doing, and I think if, if a lot of states unite, Tennessee's one, um, Nevada's another, Florida's another. I want to get a lot of states together on this. And that's what my resolution was about. The resolution that I wrote that we passed through the LPTN Executive um, Committee, that resolution is all about imploring and uh, invigorating the libertarian parties of the states within the United States of America, but not just the United States of America, abroad as well. The goal is, is for us to then put a little bit of pressure so that maybe National can put this on the front burner. And maybe by doing so, we'll get more and more press. And the more press we get, the more interviews, the more articles, perhaps it'll be picked up by even a, 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 a press agent outside of a libertarian circle. And that's what I hope for. That's what I would love to see happen. And I at least want to see it tried. I at least want to see a lot of people engaging and trying because we can, because we do have that degree of organization and because it's not going to be super expensive to do so. Now, Shane, one more thing I, I wanted to ask you about. One of the very, very few things that uh, I approved of President Obama doing was opening up relations and trade and travel with Cuba. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, restricting trade, restricting travel, that, that only hurts Cubans. So I was very glad to see him do that. It does seem, however, Donald Trump seems to be moving in a, in a different direction on that. So uh, can you speak to any changes that, that might exist now because of uh, Trump's statements? I don't know how much the reality of, of travel and sending things back and forth to Cuba has, has really changed. Uh, so perhaps you can speak on that. And then perhaps the flip side that maybe, even though I dis disapprove of his maneuver here, perhaps that will increase some pressure on the regime. And maybe they could even uh, have, have some of these issues with the Libertarian Party be brought to the attention of the Trump administration. If we push hard enough, maybe this could even be something that, that comes up when an, the political negotiations actually do take place. I think that the intention of the policy shift from what Obama had done might be genuine. I don't know. But 
it, it could just as well be pandering because the Cuban expats in Florida where he made his announcements, a lot of them were very supportive of him you know, rolling the clock back to the pre-Obama policies, some of them. And it, I, he didn't roll it back entirely. But uh, it's very much harder now to send uh, remittances. It's, it's, there is no FedEx delivery anymore in Cuba, DHL, no more. It's all going through the Postal Service, and there's, there's no telling whether or not it's going to make it. Cuban policy is that anything that's valued over $200 will be confiscated. So, um, so no, it's, it's definitely harder than it was to deliver packages. And keep in mind, this is so important of all the information that I've come across and spent time ruminating about. N Nelson, he felt it important to open a library. The ideas are very, very important. And what planted that seed in his mind were videos that he managed to have access to from Spain, from a, a Spanish professor. And so those ideas took root in him, and he recognized that within himself. And he attempted, by opening that library, to provide that same set of seeds to the people with which he communicates, the people of his community, and the people now in Camagüey even. He's traveling to the east and doing this. So it's the ideas that are so very important. And those ideas are being stifled. The, the, transmittal, the transmittal, the communication – all of that is being stifled by the rolling back of these policies to pre-Obama, to the pre-Obama period. So I personally think that it's – while it might weaken the regime, while the worry that too much tourism is going gonna, is gonna to too greatly benefit the military, which has a lot of control over there, over hotels and tourism, I think that my belief in the free market um, to bring about a change of attitude – Within people who are experiencing the benefits of that market, I think that it's greater than any damage that could be done through these policies. So I personally, I'm with you. I, I actually see this the same way that you see it. I think that it was a mistake. And I would very much like to, to be able to send packages once again through FedEx or DHL. And uh, I, think, I think Americans should remember that it was an American decision to block that from occurring. FedEx was doing business there. Cruise lines were doing business there. Air, airlines were doing business there. And it was the American regime's decision, the American administration's decision to stop those businesses from growing. So, And really, in many ways, it, it helps the regime because it gives them more ammunition to point to this great evil capitalist power up north that is the cause of all their evils in the world. It allows them to try to blame America for, for why everyone in that country is so poor, not blame the fact that they have a tyrannical socialist regime, which we know is the real cause. I think that's a fantastic point. Um, it's not one that had crossed my mind, but I, I love that idea. And there's a story that came to my head whenever you said that, that, that Nelson told me. There's a girl he was interviewing in Havana named, I think, Jimenez. And she was homeless, and she was, she was just managing her life with, you know, with nothing. And she had a child. And, and so he was talking to her, and he was interviewing her, and he was trying to get to the bottom of her homelessness and her poverty – and um, she said, just please don't be disparaging toward the regime. That's what she said at the end of their interview. And she wasn't being disrespectful. She was giving voice to her conditioning. The fact that she had spent so much time being trained, not educated, but schooled, trained, to defend the regime that would amputate her thinking. To defend the regime that would abuse her right to critical analysis that would deny her right to critical analysis. And that's the degree of conditioning that these people are under and have been under. Now, we all see it in our country, in the United States. We see a lot of conditioning that resembles that. We see that here. But the degree of it is even worse there. They've had 60 years of that degree of conditioning. They're four or five generations in. It's an uphill climb. But uh, if we do nothing, nothing will change. So let's come together on this. Let's use our organization for the greater good, which is to simply assist them. We don't have to raise a million bucks. We don't have to do anything dramatic. But I think that, I think that we should definitely um, – we should be their megaphone. 
we should be that. Because when I started reaching out to try to find information, it was challenging to get information. And it shouldn't be. The American people should be aware of the consequences of our president's policies. The, the American people should be aware of the abuses suffered at the hands of a Marxist regime upon people who value liberty and even name their library the Ben Franklin Libertarian Library. These people are our ideological counterparts who value liberty, and we need to value them. And that's how I feel, and I feel uh, feel very strongly about it. Well, absolutely, Shane, and really, it's it really is a testament to yourself as well. The fact that you know you have no personal connection to anybody in Cuba, you just simply saw what was going on, saw that there was this injustice, and decided to do something about it, and started making noise to the point that you know you're on this show, you're on the Tom Woods show, you're out there making noise, making people more aware of it. I'm glad to be a part of that because I really do think, like you said, these people are heroes. There's no other way to to, to really state it. They're absolutely heroes, and they're doing revolutionary things in a place where it is extremely extremely dangerous to do so so uh, they do deserve our support and i hope people will out there will be equally inspired by listening to your words about it uh for people that want more information about this about how they can help about how they can find out more and keep up keep up to date with what's going on with the libertarian party in cuba what are some of the best places for them to go well the best is the pan am post and that's where mamela fialo floor is at she does translations she does original articles nelson is even published there he's got several articles in which he's published. That's probably the best place to get good up-to-date information. Also, if you want something that's that's updated at least once a week, then go to the Partido Libertario Cubano Facebook site because they do post there. And some of some of the posts are very provocative and inspirational. You know, bearing in mind that they're posting these <laughs> they're posting these from the belly of the beast. You now, they're posting these from a totalitarian capital city. And every time I see a new post, I giggle and I grin, uh, and it, it, it's heartening. It makes me feel like I have a teacher who can show me about courage. Absolutely, Shane. And thank you so much, like I said, for coming on the show to let everybody know about this. It's obviously this is not something you're going to hear about on CNN or mainstream news or even in, in most of your probably Facebook and Twitter feeds, unless you're a crazy libertarian like me. So I really am happy to get the word out about this as much as possible. And I thank you so much for doing everything you're doing to spread the word as well. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show, man. Very much. Thanks, Shane. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Shane Robbins. Really amazing stuff that's going on there in Cuba. Unlike here, it is a very big risk. Not that there's no risk in America of, of stating your political beliefs or being a libertarian, but there's much greater imminent physical danger for doing so in Cuba. So uh, these people really do our support. The least you can do is, is follow them on Facebook and, and follow what's going on and try to spread the word. That doesn't cost you a dime. And if you want to hear a little bit more, kind of a personal story of mine that I really don't want to share on this podcast, but I did share that with our Pride members in the the Pride exclusive audio, uh, I did give a little bit of extra info about, you know, why I'm a little more connected to Cuba and why I really am so particularly passionate about this subject. And I don't, and that may have come through a bit in the interview, but I get a little bit more into that uh, in the bonus segment in the Pride. So just another reason to head on over to lionsofliberty.com slash support and check it out. Guys, don't forget to keep following all the work that Clint Rankin has been doing over at Walk the Walk. He regularly posts updates over in the Lions of Liberty Forum, our private Facebook group. We're doing some great work with Donor C. Right now, we're trying to build the roads. That's right. The Libertarians are going to build the roads. We're trying to finish up a road uh, for the Little Hands of Hope Orphanage, which we've talked about before. So, of course, you can find more information about that over at lionsofliberty.com slash 305. Follow Walk the Walk on Facebook. Head over to walkthewalktofreedom.com. And until next time, guys, a week from today, I'll be featuring a conversation between Judd Weiss. Many of you remember him being on this show, talking about his experiences in the Libertarian Party and, and a lot of what he saw as being oh, shenanigans, unethical behavior within the Gary Johnson campaign. Uh, I'm bringing on someone who has spoken out against Judd's accusations st quite strongly, uh, the co-founder of BeingLibertarian.com, Mr. Charles Perallo. He put it out there that if any podcast would let him air his grievances, as I did offer to do on the show that uh, you know he would be interested in doing so. Judd was also open to the conversation, so I let him go at it for uh, you know, about an hour or so. That was also released early to members of the Lions of Liberty Pride, so again, be sure to check that out. LionsofLiberty.com slash support, guys. Don't forget, coming up this Wednesday, Electric Liberty Land with Brian McWilliams and, of course, this coming Friday, 
John Odermatt takes his weekly look at the broken criminal justice system with Felony Friday. Just more reasons to go ahead and hit that subscribe button and make sure you keep listening to the show so you don't miss a thing. Until next time, folks, live long and live free. <laughs>